All right, so we can just do this while you're uh, Go. away there. I'll be quiet. You don't have to be quiet. As long, Go ahead. As, as, long as you answer the questions. Th is this your first time here? Yes. Really? Um, seems kind of strange because, uh, you know, back with the first album, you were so big. Yeah, everywhere but here. Mm -hmm. I think it sold like two. <laughs> <laughs> One of the few places in the world, though, huh? Um, didn't do that well. Yeah, uh, re you know, um, uh, yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, even in um, South America, Mexico, it did uh, did pretty well. I mean, really? it wasn't like um, it wasn't like England or Germany or you know right. the uh, America or those places, uh -huh. but. The Southeast Asia in general, that sort of didn't, quite didn't yeah. yeah, didn't take off like it did elsewhere. Mm. Is that something that the record kind of a craft question? But is that something the record? I think so. I, I I would uh, I would say <coughs> I'm pretty much yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> right on the button on that one. They say like it, it does well in Denmark, it does well in yeah, you know, that English speaking countries. Why not Asia? Why not? Uh, yeah, I just think they. Um, they didn't. Uh, they didn't really try. I think what I think, really, what happened was that they, at that point in time, they leaned so heavy on California market as opposed to the whole uh, American market, and the California market was um, n was very slow in picking up out of the hell, and it, it, even still to today. Um, Bat of Hell has never had the impact on the west coast of America that it has had around the rest of the world. And I think that, that the southeast in this area, the impact was from California more than it was from uh, from the west coast more than anything else. It's like, um, you know, as for some reason they never, the west coast never really wanted to, well they kept calling me. They didn't play Springsteen either for a very long, not until Hungry Heart, until 81, Born to Run, they, they wouldn't play him. And uh, it's just that he he put out more records than I did, <laughs> quicker. And um, and so <clears throat> they kept calling anybody, and Billy went through the same thing, Billy Joel, and they just kept calling us East Coast artists. And they said, well, the West Coast doesn't relate to the East Coast. I mean, it was this whole kind of very strange political kind of thing. And then I think the record company in America made the West Coast very upset. And so I think that had a lot to do with it. Even to this day, though, you say on the West Coast, uh, the records haven't done as well as they've done. Oh, they, and now, Bad and Hell 2 has. Mm -hmm. Bad and Hell 2. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't do in Los Angeles what it does in New York, but it's doing very well. I mean, in, in, in comparison to other records, it's doing it, you know, it's amazingly well. But New York, in that whole uh, North, uh, in America, in Canada and that uh, northeast Midwest uh, section is, uh, you know, uh, uh, if I ran for president, I would win, I believe. So, uh, but <clears throat> in comparison to, if you get into w what this record has done in the UK and, and Germany, there's bad at hell too. It's astounding. I mean, I can't even believe um, it's it's almost at two million copies in the UK at this point. Which for that smaller market is quite astounding. Yeah, and it's over. I mean, in a lot of markets already in in uh, in Germany, we've already passed Bad in a Hell mm. with this. Mm. Um, uh, so I have no idea what's going to happen, but mm -hmm. it, it's it could could be very interesting. I mean, yeah. I might have another record that's you know in the top ten sales of all time. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't really. No. It, it's it's nice and it makes uh, good press, but it, as far as that, it's I just care about my shows. <laughs> I like my live shows. I really like playing live, mm -hmm. and I um, and as far as Japan is concerned, everybody that I've ever talked to uh, about Japan, I'll get into conversation. And the, the wildest one was I once had a conversation in Australia with Daryl Hall, and. Uh, I went to see Hall and Oates play in Australia, and we went backstage and we were talking, and he, they had just come from Japan, and they, they and so I was, and I said, oh, how was Japan, and he started to tell me, and he stops, and he looks at me, and he goes, you got to go to Japan, 
and he goes on this whole uh, it, it was like he was like almost going to shake me he goes that all means he's going to love what you do he said because they really like the uh, they, they call me over the top I'm not really I'm just very dramatic in, in everything I do it's and, and I don't even plan it to be dramatic it's just it's just that I, I, I just put so much into it that it becomes that. Um, it was described uh, in the UK in a review just uh, in December that, that I sing as if my wife and children are being held captive and their life depends on it. And, and, I, and I, I thought about that for a minute and I go, yeah, he, he's right. <laughs> I do do that. Not intentionally, it's just... Just what I do. I don't. I don't say that's what I'm going to do, mm -hmm. but I. Re I really just put everything I got into it. You so you're sort of an intense, urgent type of person. It's sort of a theatrical side. Yeah, I mean, I, I. I just that I'd let it just. I just let it go. I don't. I don't stand outside and look at myself as what bad actors do, and I don't uh, uh, <clears throat> sit and. And I get the excuse me. I get the feeling that singers. I don't know, because I really have never discussed this with singers. This is only my opinion. That singers tend to, uh, when they sing, listen to themselves sing. And I, I am, and, and I don't necessarily know that that makes them bad singers, but I know that if you're an actor and you watch yourself act, that you're a bad actor. So um, you, you have to, um, when, you, when you act, you, you cannot be there. You know, you. Uh, it's like when De Niro acts. Robert De Niro is not part of it. <laughs> Robert De Niro goes, takes another. Sort of like what you would imagine, like Linda Blair went through in. in, in uh, it's being possessed by the spirit or the soul of the person that you're playing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the best uh, I've ever seen is. Um, uh, I mean, De Niro's great all the time, and Olivier. But uh, uh, one of the best examples is Hoffman and Rain Man. If you've ever seen the person that he played, you'd swear that that uh, this particular um, person had possessed Dustin Hoffman. I mean, it was like the transition and and the technique and the, the what he, what Hoffman did in that it will just floor you if you see the two people side by side. Okay. Uh, what we have to do, me is is kind of back. Back up yeah, that's fine. Because you can uh, back up. I go on forever. I, I have free association. Let, let me say I'm sort of like a sort of like a psychologist, and I I, I like uh, I take care of a lot of um, angst when I do these interviews. I throw things out and get rid of uh, a yeah. lot of things. We'll have you lay down on the couch. Yeah, well, probably might as well. I do that anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> this uh, magazine you're rocking on is the number one selling magazine in Japan. Oh, I know that. However. <laughs> um, they have no idea who I am. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they could tell you the name of all of Sting's kids. They can tell you, you know, who's in the, uh, you know, the, the Red Dwarfs and the uh, the Yellow Shoes and all these British bands that have just made it big overnight and stuff. But they don't know who Meat Loaf is. Who are the Red Dwarfs? No, just oh, well, you made that up. Oh, like the Screaming Chipmunks. <laughs> exactly. The Fireworks or whatever. Mm. You know, they, they can tell you every, hit, every big hit these, these bands ever had because they're... That's fine. We can go backwards. Yeah, so what I wanted to ask you about was... When Bat the, the first Bat of the Hell hit it big, you were already on the road. I mean, you were doing actually doing acting and music, right? Oh, I've, yeah, I've always done that. Um, I was lucky enough. I mean, I started out, I was a football player, and I, did, and I got hurt and couldn't do that anymore. And I, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And uh, then my mother um, became very ill and died, and it really upset me. And so I left Texas, and I, I, I didn't want to be anywhere where she was or where she had been or anywhere my life had been I, I wanted I, I ran away I tried to escape uh, you know you can't do that but I know that now but so I went to California and I, and I was working as a bouncer in a teenage nightclub and uh, um, this is how the name uh, actually uh, kept going because when I went to California no one everybody before then knew me as Meatloaf everybody called me Meat that ever, since I was about eight years old, since about 1959, 58, 59. And um, uh, so when I went to California, they were calling me Tex. 
and it drove me crazy. And I said, stop calling me Tex. And they go, well, what did they call you? <laughs> you know, and my real name, my real name was Marvin, but I could not ever, nobody's ever called me that my entire life. Because I hated it. From the time that I was old enough to know that that's what my name was, I, when I was little, I would say, don't call me that. I remember, that's one of the only things I remember about being little is that people would go, Marvin, come in. I go, in this little voice, don't call me that! You know? Um, and so people call me by my initials, ML. And that's where Meatloaf actually actually came from was from a because they they could did a lot of things with the initials Mary Lou Mighty Large Meatloaf whatever and so they were calling me Tex in California and I said stop calling me that and I said well, well what do people call you um, in Texas and I I said ML because they if they didn't call me Meat they called me ML which were the, my initials and so out there it was like they kept going Mel no, not Mel. M period L. Period. And finally, I said, they call me Meat, okay? Uh, meat, okay, great. So everybody started, <clears throat> out there, started do, calling me Meat. And so uh, I left California and went into Michigan and had a rock and roll band. Uh, the first, it was called Meatloaf Soul. And then it changed its name three or four times. And played all the time in the late 60s. Well, I don't know. Oh, rock. I mean, it's we rock were and rock and roll. Uh -huh. So, um, uh, we pl oh, I, I opened in the late 60s to any band that was popular. Don't I mean, people have tried to go, well, did you open to the, you know, the Screaming Chipmunks? I go, no, they weren't popular. But every band that, you could, that had records and that were popular that you can think of, with the exception of the Jefferson Airplane, the Beatles, and the Rolling Stones, anybody else that you, Hendrix, the Who... Probably be passing through town. Yeah, they were passing through town. Sometimes um, at the at big festivals like Detroit Rock and Roll Revival, where Grand Funk actually was the opening act, and and uh, um, and and they were and I Joe Cocker opened to me. Were very popular. We had hit records locally, so Joe Cocker would come through town, and they would he would open to me at, at the Saginaw ballroom of wherever it was you know and um, but we did leave we were uh, we played in uh, Michigan Indiana Ohio uh, uh, Illinois we went as far in, as to Chicago once and opened to Buddy Guy and and I did uh, 62 dates with Ted Nugent that's where I met like Nugent and I did a lot with the MC5 and and Bob Seeger and uh, all, all Michigan acts. yeah every yeah everybody and James Gang, which was from Ohio, and uh, um, the McCoys, which were also from Ohio, Rick Derringer sure. and them. So, and um, <laughs> so a lot. That whole that was that was my uh, my base. That's where I started. But I was always dramatic. I mean, I always like w wanted to blow things up and and because uh, I didn't know any better. But I was, was always this original music. Were you writing your own stuff? Yeah, it was really bad too. <laughs> it was people go, well, how come they didn't get a record deal? I said, because the material sucked. We did a lot of cover stuff. I mean, we were covering, you know, Traffic and and Vanilla Fudge, but we'd throw those in to this original stuff. But the one one of the songs we had a local hit with was a Lee Michaels song called War. And um, so uh, so then I went back to... That band broke up, and I went back to California, and I was uh, trying to put it, get another band going, and I had a friend who worked, at the Aquarius parking lot, parking cars because he, the musical hair was playing there. Now I didn't know what the musical hair was at, at that particular point in time, and uh, the guy he was working with, there were maybe two, maybe three. I don't know how many people were helping park the cars. It's a fairly big place. Anyway, one of them was leaving and wasn't going to do it anymore. And so he said to me, he knew that I was looking for a job, but I wanted to keep my band. So he goes, you know, you. He said, you can come and, you know, the owner's going to come down at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning and meet me there and, and, and I'll hook you up with a gig. I said, great, let's do it. And uh, so I went down there at 11. The owner was late. There was all these people outside, the, I mean like thousands of people outside this theater. 
I said, what's going on? He says, oh, it's a, it's a musical. It's some kind of hippie musical. Named, I said, hey, I said, oh, okay. And uh, I had, I'd never heard of it before. Seriously, and it was a big hit. And, uh, you know, I guess that I knew the song because Aquarius let the sun shine in, but I didn't know what it was from. And so one of the cars pulled in, and this guy's name was Barney, and he starts talking to this guy, and he introduces me, and he says, this is, this is me. And the guy goes, meat? That's a funny name. And Barney goes, yeah, it's meatloaf. Isn't that funny? And I go, well, meat, just, you know. And so he goes, what do you do? And I say, I sing. And he says, well, why don't you audition for this? And I said, audition for what? He says, well, that's what all these people are here doing. And I said, oh, I don't know. So he goes, come on. So I go in with this guy, and, and he introduces me to this guy named Armand Coulet, who's still a friend of mine now, um, and uh, the, who's the director. And, and he says, this is, this is Meatloaf. And uh, Meatloaf's a singer. And Armand says, well, okay, well, go ahead, put him up. And there's thousands of people with pictures and songs and this. And so he walks up and he goes, well, what are you going to sing for me? And I said, what do you mean, what am I going to sing for you? I, I came for a job in the parking lot. And he goes, well, I thought you were a singer. I said, well, I do. And he says, well, then sing something. So I, so the piano, I looked at the piano player and, and, I, and I told him, I want to do this old blues song. And I said, the name of the song is The World Is All Right, It's the People That Make It Bad. And I said, but it's tricky, because I said there's a double turnaround at the end of every... Uh, uh, I said, instead of 16, it's like actually like an 18-bar kind of thing, because there's a little tricky phrase. And I got through the first stanza of it, and they stopped me. And they said to me, can you be here at 6 o'clock tonight? And uh, I said, uh, yeah, what for? And they go, well, we'd like for you to do our, our play there's a guy leaving and we would like for you to take his place. And I said, well, okay. And then they told me how much money I would make. And I said, okay, fine, I'll be here. I mean, you know, I think it was like uh, three, $400 a week, which was like 1969, 1970, somewhere. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Um, I'm, uh, how old am I? I'm not even 20 yet. Mm -hmm. And so... I'm going, yeah, no problem. <laughs> Count me in. And so, uh, but that's how I got involved in theater. And so the name Meatloaf then, when, when Actors' Equity, because you had to join Actors' Equity, which is the actors' union in, in America. They wanted to use Meatloaf as my name, obviously, so I joined Actors' Equity. And I eventually wound up not ever doing that production because the guy that I was going to replace decided not to leave and they sent me to New York. Um, they put me right into New on Broadway. I did Detroit for a while, and then I wound up in uh, doing Broadway. And uh, when I was there, um, people just kept coming to me and, and want me to do other plays all the time. Mm. And uh, and I wound up doing. Um, uh, I wound up working for Joe Papp and wound up doing. Um, uh, two Shakespeare's in the Park, New York Shakespeare Festival for Joe Papp. And I said to Joe, uh, who... Um, see, sometimes now in movies, they, they, when I first get hired in a movie, they never want to use the name Meatloaf because it, they, they think it's funny. And uh, it's a, Meatloaf is a double-edged sword. And I'll, we'll go to that in a second. But, but I said to Joe Papp, do you, do you want to use Meatloaf? He goes, this was for Shakespeare. He says, absolutely. And he always called him Bill. He'd, he said, Bill Shakespeare would love your name. He said he would put it in the plays if he was alive writing today. So uh, the, the first one I had a minor role in, and the second one I had a, a pretty good role in it, and it said, uh, Joe Papp presents William Shakespeare's As You Like It, starring Royal Julia, Mary Beth Hurt, and Meatloaf. And Clive Barnes, who was a New York critic, was the first to ever call me Mr. Loaf, because in the, the, for the actors, they always used Mr. Mm. Julia, you know, Miss Hurt, Mr. Loaf, and, and I got, and, and so that sort of legitimized me in, in New York and in the theater circle. So nobody ever felt it was funny, and I did Sam Shepard plays, and I did a one act at Actor Studio that was, uh, uh, you know, Actor Studio is the famous um, <coughs> where Brando studied and everything, and I did a one act play, a 20 minute one act, um, one man one act for them. In which, um, oh, what's his name directed? Oh, come on. Uh, uh, oof. I 
I forgot the guy who ran it. Um, uh, no, don't, don't it's okay, but um, <clears throat> it was one of the you know the famous acting teacher of all Pacino and everybody, <clears throat> and so uh, uh, um, I, it was very. But at the same time that that was going on, I was down at Max. I had a I was sitting in with rock and roll bands down at Max's Kansas City and all these rock clubs all through Manhattan. So I would be doing. Uh, and we were also doing uh, singing. I was doing rock at some rock clubs, but I was also singing Steinman stuff at some dinner. Uh, well, they, they're not dinner, but they're they're like uh, not piano bars, and they're they're sort of like supper clubs. Only they have dinner there. It's not a rock club, and you go and you just sing with a piano. So I would do that as well as like doing you know. Um, uh, old rock songs and with cover bands sitting at Max's Kansas City and different and doing Shakespeare. So it was like this, the people that I was doing Shakespeare with thought I was completely out of my mind from day one. And the people at the rock clubs, when they figured out that I was also doing Shakespeare, they thought, what the hell's wrong with you? And then these people at these supper clubs would find out I'm doing rock and roll because they knew I'd be doing Shakespeare and they'd find out that I'm also appearing down here at Max's Kansas City with with Lizard or somebody, you know. And and, and so it just became this thing and and people would say to me, when we first tried to get Bat Out of Hell signed, people go, you're an actor, you can't do rock and roll. And then after Bat Out of Hell became very successful, people just go to me, well, you're a rock and roll guy, You, 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 you can't act. I go, well, wait a second. You got to understand that's what they said to me ten years ago about the the rock and roll. You can't do both, but you can. And I, so I've always said I've never I was never a rock and roller who decided I wanted to act, and I was never an actor who decided I wanted to do rock and roll. It both just sort of happened. Uh, what I really wanted to do was play football, <laughs> and so that was my real goal in life. And and. Uh, I mean, so people say to me, "What would you? Well, if you could choose, what would you choose? Acting or, or uh, rock and roll?" I go, "Neither one. I'd be playing defensive tackle for the Cowboys if I had, if I could choose." So, but I think that it was chosen for me, and I think that I do what I'm supposed to do because I'm very happy doing it. You said you had been singing stuff that Stylin wrote at these supper clubs. Um, it was original all the way back from till 70, 74, 73. So you first met Stylin about that? 70, 71. 71. December. Actually, we're trying to figure out whether it was December of 71 or De- I think it was December of 71. Uh-huh. What, what, how did you meet up? And what, was, what brought you together? He, I auditioned for him. He had written the music to a Michael Weller play that... That was my first uh, play with Pat. And I had been doing um, um, an off-Broadway play. Um, <clears throat> the guys who wrote Hair had done another play and I was doing their play off Broadway. wasn't a hit and I was also doing um, working at Cafe La Mama and the Manhattan Theater Club. Uh, so I was going between those three places all the time. Uh, Shakespeare Festival. Uh, um, I, I, I was for the six years that I worked in theater in New York, or and I was at the Kennedy Center in D.C. and in, in L.A. at the Roxy doing Rocky York. I was never out of work for one day. And and a lot of times I would have, um, oh, we got to, so I was so pompous in New York in the early days that uh, <laughs> that I, re- I refused to audition. I find this hard to believe. Is that right? Yeah, you I mean. Sort of the, the up and coming, you were the up and coming actor at the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would audition once. Uh-huh. And I would say, you've seen what I've done. They, my agent would call me back and say, they'd like for you to come back. And I'd say, no. They've seen me. They know what I do. They either want me or they don't. And he'd go, are you sure? And i go, yeah. And every time I did it, they'd always want me. And so, I mean, I would get his... I mean, I remember <clears throat> turning down roles that, like, John Travolta got because I turned it down and all that. You know, and, and I was working... Oh, yeah. I mean, I was working with Ron Silver and uh, Raul and Fred Gwynn and Mary Beth and... and uh, so, so wait, if the music thing hadn't happened, you would have been right up with these acting icons. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I worked with you know with Billy Murray and John Bellucci and and Gilda and. Uh, I find it hard to believe that you, you did Shakespeare. Huh? That was you were. Yeah. Like, I did Rodrigo. Just, 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 just a couple lines here. It's like, what, what does it sound like when, when, when Meat Loaf does Shakespeare? I just like I'm talking to you now. Only he just does thou not know wherefore thou goest into the night. Shall not thou come before thy awaken? I mean, it's the same. Shakespeare is not some hidden mystery that everybody wants to think it is. And the way I found that out 
was I was scared to death when I was hired. I'd never read Shakespeare. I had no I cheated and you know, you read Cliff Notes in high school. And and so I had no idea. I, I didn't have a clue. And and I was like I'm going, what do I do with this? It's like it's weird. And I watched Mickey Rooney <clears throat> when he was young had done a movie in England of a Midsummer Night's Dream. And uh, and he played Puck. And one night I was it was on the late, late movie on CBS. And, I, you know, normally if I saw that kind of stuff, I'd just go, oh, come on, give me a break. Get out of here. I don't want to see this. But I said, oh, I better watch this. i got to watch this. And uh, it wasn't very long into the movie that the woodsmen were sitting around this campfire. And they were all just sitting there talking, just like we do now. The only difference is that uh, Shakespeare wrote in two kinds of languages. He wrote, that's why the people in the street went out and saw it. I mean, they were just people, just, you know, it wasn't for the, for, like a lot of the classical composers composed for kings and, and, and for the royalty. Well, Shakespeare was writing for the masses. And he did have the ability of knowing the, in his writing, educated enough to know the proper language of the day, uh, which the the royals or the sophisticated or the uh, you know the philosophers or the would know. But also, he also wrote very street, as if you were to go now. Somebody would write Forty Second Street language, you know, like Jive Time, Nickel Down, Popcorn Goody, you know, that kind of stuff. So he wrote that. He incorporated both languages and the, the slangs and the colloquialisms and all that. So it's just a matter of talking and and the language was no different than uh, you know than the rap guys would use and you just have to learn the, the language and and it, but it was like they just sit around this campfire and we're talking so I went oh I got it and that's really what I learned from this one thing and my reviews for it were I mean I got astounding reviews for I, I, I was lucky I guess, but um, Clive Barnes, the review from Clive Barnes was he said, Mr. Julia, Miss Hurt, and Miss, Mr. Loaf were the only three real people on stage last night. So I've treasured that review my whole life. You know, I mean, that was like, and he called me Mr. Loaf, which was my favorite thing. <laughs> well, let's get back to you and Steinman then. You had met up with him when you auditioned for him in 71. Yeah. <laughs> Take us, take us to Bad Out of Hell, though. How, how did you uh, eventually collaborate for that? Well, people had always told me that I could sing and I had a great, you know, I, you can sing, you got a great voice. Thank you very much. But it wasn't until I sang a Jim Steinman song in a Pat production that I got, and that's when I started working for Joe. What was the name of that particular song? Uh, uh, it was called More Than You Deserve, which was, it wasn't called More Than You Deserve when we started. It became, it became More Than You Deserve when we were moving it to Lincoln Center. Uh, because that was the song that I sang, and they named the show that. You became uh, a show piece. That's yeah, that, well, the song actually stopped the show, mm -hmm. and it's and as it, the show grew, first we did it in a little workshop situation, and the first night we did it, it stopped the show. It was only 100 people, but it stopped the show. And as it grew to the off-Broadway house of 300, it again stopped the show, and when it moved up again, uh, and it became famous, and by the time people knew about it all over town and, and by the time that it got to its biggest theater it they, I've never seen it since then it, inside a written piece of a show people actually stood up and yelled for more so I mean I think it sort of became uh, the thing to do but at the same time it was legitimate you know what I'm saying it was like people would go you got to see this, it stops the show. So they would come anticipating that it would stop the show, and then it became sort of like this Rocky Horror thing where they throw rice at the screen. I mean, they it was, you know, one one led to the other. But they actually, it became so absurd that they actually wrote in, I sang another chorus hmm. into the play, and it was dialogue that led it to get there again. So that was very funny. But from that, I knew that there was something... Uh, Special when I got a hold of these Jim Steinman songs because he had written everything in that play. And there were better songs, as far as I was concerned, inside the play. Uh, but that one seemed to... 
the combination seemed to work really well. So uh, by pulling teeth, because he's not exactly um, Mr. Spunky, he, he, you know, I mean, he can, he, his pacing is very slow, and he's not really ag aggressive when it comes to uh, wanting his work shown or done or any of that kind of thing. That it, the combination of us two in that regard as well, because I, I, I don't mind doing this kind of. He could never keep up. So you know, from that kind. Of, so I really pushed him and got him to write these songs because he wrote songs that you think they. Uh, People think they're funny now with a bridge here and a bridge there, and this goes there. And then forget that. If people keep going, there's three songs in one. I said, you should see the songs he used to write. There was 15 in one. At least we got him into making records. You know, it was like, well, so you, you had a grand desire at the time then, to put out one record. No, we didn't. Well, I don't think we even knew we were writing a record. We we, we we were just trying to perform, and and we actually sold that Carnegie Hall in 1975, long before, just on the basis of what people knew us around in New York. Wait, uh, so that Carnegie Hall as a solo act. Yeah. I came to see you yeah. do style and stuff. Yeah. Okay. But it was an extension of the theater, though. Just, yeah. It was just a, you took the songs and you sang. Well, like, no, they weren't. They, none of them were in the. <clears throat> none of those. More than you deserve would be the only one that was in oh, the theater yeah. piece. The rest of them were took the words and batted to hell and those kind of mm -hmm. things. And, and the, But the record companies really refused to acknowledge that Jim Steinman's songs uh, people would like. They went. And I'm going, well. If people don't like them, why are they here? And they kept going, well, they're here to see you. And I kept going, all right, I'll give you that. But I'm telling you what, before these Jim Steinman songs, nobody wanted really, I mean, they kept telling me I could sing, but I wasn't selling tickets. I said, there's a combination here that, that works. And they just didn't see it. And I mean, they wanted, every record company wanted to sign me, but they didn't want me to do Jim Steinman songs, and so I said, well, then I really don't want to do this, because what, I think it's real important. What did they want you to do, though? Oh, try it. Did they have other, like, in-house composers? Yeah, or? yeah, they wanted me to do, like, soul music. I mean, they really wanted me to be a, you know, because uh, my roots are really blues, gospel kind of thing, and, and, and Jimmy said, that's real, to me, that's real pedestrian, and that's real easy for you to do, and and so why go with what's easy? Go against the grain. That's what's going to make it a lot more interesting. And I agreed with him. Because, they, you know, I had Bill Withers on the phone calling me up and, and saying he wanted to write songs for me. And I'm saying, look, I think you're great for yourself, but I don't think you're right for me. I mean, it's like, I don't think it's going to work. And, uh, I mean, Jimmy was saying that, and I, I believed him. And we went against the grain because I have that, that root of blues gospel, but at the same time, uh, well, at the same time that this was going on, I also, which is even wilder, I also had an offer uh, <coughs> from the sponsors of the, of the opera company in New York, who had come to me and offered to pay me sixty. Look, ready for this number in 1973, sixty thousand dollars a year for five years, so three hundred thousand dollars guaranteed. And what I was going to do was study opera for five years and then I would make my premiere at, at, the, at the opera company in New York. Is that right? Yeah. That's extraordinary. They must have because I'm a, held, I'm a held in tenor and held in, the, there's, there's, they're very rare. There is, there was two in the opera and, and now there's only one and he's an Italian. The other one was, was from Texas and he died recently. He was uh, Bill somebody. And he, he was 60-something years old, and the other one is an Italian who's in his 50s. Heldon, Heldon it's Heldon. a Heldon tenor. What does Heldon mean? Ba basically, what the definition is, you sing a lot higher than it sounds. Okay. <laughs> it's, that's basically what goes on. Um, uh, Pavarotti is not a Heldon tenor. He's a, I forgot, some other kind of tenor. But, but, but the, they saw me sing, the first Shakespeare I did, I sing a song, one of the Shakespeare lyrics, and Bill... Uh, David Shire, who wrote a lot of movie music, wrote the wrote the thing, and they heard me do this Shakespearean, you know, lyrics to David Shire, and they all flipped out. This was in the first Shakespeare, and they all went crazy, and uh, they were following me around and calling, and I and I just kept going. I'm really not interested in opera so much. I I, I checked it out just because it's sixty thousand dollars a year. It sounded very interesting. 
And, but I found out that the conductor really is in total control of everything. In tempos, keys, you have no say-so. Uh, unless you are a Pavarotti or a, a, a Beverly Sills or something like that. And even then, it is a struggle for them when the operas are actually put up for them to go against the conductor. The conductor is the, is the you know, the, the big rooster here. He controls the hen house. And... Uh, and I'm, uh, my, I just knew my nature because I had terrible fights with David Shire over how he wanted me to sing his music. And I'm saying to him, I'm not going to sing it that way. You want, I'm not going to phrase it that way. I'll phrase it the way I want to phrase it. I'm going to phrase it the way I think the meaning's going to come across. And that's how I've always been with Jimmy or whoever. Uh, I don't... I, I never phrase the way musicians would want you to phrase. You know, they always go, you know, you're a little ahead of the beat. Or, you know, I said, well, that's because the phrasing needs to be that way for the dramatic, to, for the lyrics to come through the right. And so I have these huge arguments. That's my one argument with the world is, is and I go, I don't care what you do musically, I'm going to do this lyrically. And, and so you, I, I know that I would not have lasted six months doing that just because of the nature of how I think. So I turned that down, and and uh, and Jimmy and I just started working, and we went through, we uh, I was hell trying to get that signed because nobody believed in Jim Steinman's stuff. Right. It wasn't exactly a product of the times, and yet it came. It's not out. a product of the times now either. Right. Not, not now either. Although it is unique and it's sort of theatrical. I believe. Yeah, I believe it's the true alternative. <laughs> yeah. When I first heard it, I, I thought it was like. Uh, a soundtrack or something. Um, you know, like I couldn't believe it was just a regular uh, a pop album. So Bad Out of Hell comes out, and it's a huge success. And obviously, you know, you guys had the, the formula down. At that point, though, did you want to become like a self-contained artist? Did you want to write your own stuff, or did you want to go off in your own direction? Is no, that what you no I, I just quit. I didn't want to be famous. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why you didn't hear from me again, mm -hmm. really, at that point in time. Because people have always gone... They always write this phrase, and I let them, and I never argue with them, and I just kind of they go, well, it was a one-hit wonder. And what they, what, uh, I always believe that if you want to write something or you want to say something, then you should come from a place of knowledge instead of a place of ignorance. And when they write that, they're coming from a place of ignorance. Because what happened is... Uh, in 1979, if we would have gone, if I would have gone ahead and done the record that we were going to do, it would have been out probably in 1979 at the latest, January of 1980. This, With, is, this is the follow-up. Yeah, the follow yeah. <clears throat> but I didn't. Um, Bad at Hell at one point was the biggest selling record in the world. I mean, it, it was in America. It was doing five, six hundred thousand units a week, and it did it for. <clears throat> Oh, like a good eight weeks, which is huge. I mean, it was... I think think time was unheard of. Yeah. Oh, it was gigantic. Yeah, right. There was no way that anyone was going to... could tell me to this day that if we had to put that record out, that record wouldn't have been... Maybe the next... You know, I don't know how good it would have been. I can't tell you that. But all I know is that that record would have been as big as this one is. And maybe bigger... Or whether the third one would have, you never know about that, you know. But but it would have worked. And so I never have gone with that theory because I it was a self-imposed exile that I went through because I just... I mean, I was doing things to CVS like having them... They would go, the new star on the horizon, and I was going, take the word star out. Don't I don't want to be called a star. That's not what I am. And I finally wound up going to a psychologist for a year and a half to deal with the word... to with, deal with being called a star. I don't understand this though, because everything you've done thus far, you've sort of been uh, touted as as you know a, a star on the horizon anyway, whether you were an actor. Or yeah, but the, it's a, the the difference. There's a difference when you do theater in New York. You can be sitting at a, 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 and having dinner, or being walking down the street, and people come up to you and go, "Oh, I saw you in that production. I thought you were great. Oh, thank you very much." And they go, and you go, and and it's that's it. It doesn't require any more than that. It's a compliment for your work, you know. Uh, 
every so often somebody wanted to do an interview. You know, when you'd leave the theater, ever so often somebody would ask for an autograph. There was no... You didn't, you didn't feel like you were responsible uh, for something, you know? Um, and then in 77, and there was so many... It became, I became so famous that so many people were going to give me advice, and it was like being eaten by piranha. Uh, because also, it, in that theater world, people don't necessarily come around you wanting this, wanting that. You're kind of shielded in that theater world. You don't have, you know, these... Uh, because there's not enough money from the... There's not enough money involved with it. That's when they all come out. When they, when they see the money side of it. When you're doing theater in New York and you're doing off-off-Broadway pieces, yeah, you know, people see your work and they like you and you're in the inner circle, you're, you're known. But, I mean, you know, nobody's going to come after you because you're making $800 a week, I can tell you that. But when you start talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars, then you play a whole other game. And I didn't like that game. I really didn't like it because I never have done anything for the money. And anybody who knows me, and even knows my theater past, uh, turning down Broadway shows to go off and do some off-Broadway piece because I wanted to do the work. I, I wanted to do the Sam Shepard, uh, you know, Billy, Billy the Kid and Gene Harlow instead of the uh, Andrews sisters over here, and that's the exact truth. I went and did some off-Broadway show, which was paying me, <clears throat> off-Broadway, which was paying me $65, $65 a week plus d uh, subway tokens, instead of doing something that was going to pay me a thousand dollars a week on Broadway. And I chose that work because I thought that I would learn more from that and that that was a better experience as an actor than, than uh, being in an Andrews Sisters vehicle, which John Travolta got. And uh, so I've never done anything for, for the money or for that kind of thing. And so um, I wasn't about to do it then. And I w it was all about money and about what everybody wanted. And uh, really didn't, everybody started coming around going, listen, I did this for you, and I did this for you. And I'm going, yeah, okay. You know, and it was like they, they wanted, they wanted something. And it, 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 it happened now, uh, a few weeks ago. And I just, I went, I said to everybody, I said, it, I'm, um, same thing has happened to me that happened in 1978. Everybody's coming around me and they're going, I did this and I did that and I want this and I want that. And, and I said, uh, I'll quit again. I said, I'll leave. I said, everybody better get them away from me. You just tell them to go away. Uh, I, I really said that. I said it to my wife. I said it to, I said it to the record company. I said it to management. I said, I'll quit. Because I don't need this. I don't want this. I don't need this. This is not what I'm about. Right. And uh, so they did. They got them away from me and said, "Okay, what? bam." And that's you know that's over. Now I can now I can go and I can do my work. I can do what I want to do. So you you thought out how to sort of protect you, shield yourself from the yeah by saying uh, by saying that's it. I don't. I've done. They know I've done it before. Yeah. I've walked away before. And then what happened? What I wouldn't do this time that I did before was I was threatened that I, I must work or they're going to sue me. And I went and did this record called Dead Ringer that I was not there and <coughs> do not like. And uh, yeah, it did four or five million copies. And if you look at it, it was before, before anything for love, it had the biggest single I've ever had, which was Dead Ringer for Love. But I don't consider that successful. I don't consider that a successful record because I hate the thing. I mean, I'm, I'm not there. I can't listen to it. I never have been able to listen to it. People go, oh, I like that record. I, I cringe when I hear the word. I, I cringe when I see a cover. Because I go, oof, oof. It was a big mistake. Yeah, I don't like that work. And I mean, there's been, we, Jim and I have actually talked, because Jimmy didn't get involved in that. He wrote all the songs, but he wasn't there. Oh, that right? He wrote the songs. Yeah, he wrote the songs, but he wasn't there. And in the last year, we have talked oh, 15, 20 times about totally re-recording the whole thing. Really? The same songs. But you, you have to, to do that, you really better put your armor on. Uh, because the normal, the, unless you sit and talk to me and understand why I would do it, the, uh, uh, 
it, it would be a uh, it would be like a turkey shoot for the press because they would think we're just doing it for um, money or whatever. Right. And and the only reason that I would want to do it is because I have to do the work right. The work is wrong, and I want to correct the work. You know, and and if you and to me, it's like if I if you have if you have that opportunity to correct your work that was wrong, correct it. You know, it's like if you were painting this wall and it dried, and you went, "Oh, it's it's wrong." Nobody would say to you, "Well, you're crazy for painting over it." You know, and and artists must do. You know, artists who paint pictures in private must do that constantly. Mm -hmm. Must go paint something and go, "Oh, I don't like this work," and paint right over it. How many things have been painted over mm -hmm. by artists? Mm -hmm. And so I don't can I don't look at it any different than that of painting over it. So I think we have to wind this down here. To get, get to the well, you left me for the past. <laughs> right. Okay, so we're going to get get to the present here. You had been performing uh, quite frequently. You were on the road a lot. Oh. And, and during the interim, Bad I Hell, the first one, has continued to sell. I believe it's up to, what, 20, 20? Uh, I, I don't know. It's probably somewhere. I probably, yeah. Like They're admitting at this point to 25. I think it's somewhere close. I think it's like 35 million. In the last four years, it's been like, in America, it's gone platinum every gone year. Platinum every year, yeah. uh, as which as is like for 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 most bands, that's like huge success. Right. But you know, nobody. I, I didn't. I don't preach it, and I don't go around and, and search out press and and wave my own banner. I just go about doing what I do. So, so why was 1993 the year that you had to sort of renew things? I don't know. Right? Just it was the it was when we finished it. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was just. It was four years in the making. No, no, we we. Uh, we decided to do it in 1986. Mm -hmm. The record company I was on didn't want it. Didn't want it. Uh, they said it was too expensive. They didn't trust Jim Steinman, mm -hmm. which I understand those reasons. I mean, I understand that. But if I'm with him, it's a different thing. Right. So um, then in '89 we signed with Virgin and MCA, and we didn't really. I know it's what the press kit says. We took four years in the making. <laughs> But never believe what you read, even in my own bio. Um, <laughs> the uh, um, uh, we started uh, work on it in December of '90, and we rehearse at the piano until May of '91. That's because mm -hmm. that's when all the changes take place. That's when I make all the moves inside the songs, and 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 everybody thinks Jim Steinman writes long songs. He doesn't. He he writes long songs, but Meatloaf makes them longer. He writes like six-minute songs, and I turn them into 12-minute songs. I don't quite know. Because I go, well, we need this part here. Now write that. And I want this instrumental here. Let's add that. Okay, now we need to repeat this several times. And and uh, it turns out to be 12 minutes. And and uh, so um, in, in 90, um, he can't. Once every once something is put on tape, he can never change it. So that's why I have to rehearse with him so long to make all the changes before we ever get it on tape. So the minute it gets on tape, and he takes it home, it's locked. You can't. That's it. It's over. No, no more changes. I can't change a lyric. I can't do anything. But up until that point, oh, we I change everything. I make him rewrite verses, and sometimes I every once in a while there's my line sitting in there, but I I don't. Con he writes so well that I don't even attempt to write. I mean, I suppose I've written things, and but I hate it because he writes so well. I can never equal him. So why try? Mm -hmm. So what, why did it take so long? I mean, you, had, you, you said there, there came a time when you just sort of put stuff in the can, and that was the end of it. Why did it take two years for that to? Uh, oh well, because the way we work, we we go in the studio for five weeks, and then we pull out for five weeks, and we listen. Jimmy knows. I guarantee you, every hundredth of a second of this record, he can listen to listen to it 16 hours a day. You call him up in the morning and you go, what are you doing? Oh, I'm listening to the track. So, okay, and you call him up. You know, you've gone to the movies, you've done this. You've I listen for four hours and I'm like blind. I'm going, okay, that's it. And I call him up, I go, uh, you know, I call him up late at night. I go, what are you doing? Oh, I'm listening. What have you been doing today? Oh, i just been listening. Jimmy, you've been sitting here for 16 hours listening? Yeah. I mean, I've known him to, I, this is true, I have known him to to be awake and listen for as many as 32 hours at a time. And he will go on and on and on forever uh, listening. And so we pull out of the studio like four, 
four weeks at a time, five weeks at a time. Once we were out for nine weeks on this project, I was losing my mind. I'm going, we got to go back in. Okay, I'm not quite ready to go back in. Well, when are you going to be ready? Well, I'm, I'm still listening. Jim, we've been listening for eight weeks. I know, but i got to listen. So for him, this record was very fast. I mean, very slow. And for me, it was... No. For him, this record was very fast. For me, it was an eternity. Right. You could have spent, spent more time doing it. He could st we'd still be working on it. One last question. Are you going to disappear again? <laughs> not, not unless those people make me. How, how would they make you? What, by, what, what would cause you? By uh, interfering with, what I, with, with my work. Because mm -hmm. that's really why I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm not here... I'm not here for anything other than the work. And when people start fooling with the work and taking um, away from the work, I'll, I'll go away. I don't, it, it, because that's what, that's what it's about to me. When they start, it, it, other things interfere with the work, I don't like it. So I, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do it when they do that. When you sell this many records, I can't just tell them to buzz off when they yeah, just You can, but, but you got to understand that they don't like it. They get very angry when you, yeah. you know, when you start. You're talking. It's this is big. You're talking business at this point, point. and business is fine. And I, you know, you expect to get paid for what you do, and that's fair and good. But at the same time, that's not the, that's not the motivation. Money is not the motivation. Motivation is the work, mm -hmm. and that's what it will be with me forever. And and so if they people want to take that motivation away from me, I don't want to. I don't want to do the work. I'll go do some other work. I'll go hide again for a while. I'll go do off Broadway shows. Nobody knows I I'm there. I'm there. Sixty five bucks a week. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, thanks a lot. You so bet. Thank you. Run out the clock here. Good luck on. Uh, Thank you very much. Stuff. Yeah. And um, hope I'm in Japan in the fall. It's a tour. Yeah. Well, when does when does touring start? Oh, uh, we've I've already done fifty five shows. Four. And uh, we've already. Uh, we've got another 50.